Welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I am so glad that you decided to watch this video. No matter where you are, uh, no matter what time of day you're watching this, I know that the Lord has something in store for you. And my prayer is that God will speak life into you. Uh, would you take a moment to pray with me? Father, we are so grateful and thankful for every day, for every moment that you keep breath in our lungs. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to look into your word. Lord, I, I pray for those who are in need of, of prayer. Maybe it's a, a need of healing, Lord God. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Lord, would you meet them where they are? Father, I pray for all the unspokens. Lord, you know every detail. May you have your will and your way in and through every situation. God, I pray that you'll be with this pandemic. Thank you for this vaccine that's coming out and uh, Lord, we're seeing um, numbers go down, and God, we just pray that you will uh, take this pandemic away, that it will dissipate, and most importantly, through all of this, through this pandemic that we've been going through for the last year and a half, Lord God, I pray that this will bring us closer to you. Father, I pray for those who have lost loved ones recently. Lord, I pray that you'll wrap your loving arms around them. Bring mercy and grace to them during this difficult time of loss. And God, as we look into your word today, I pray that it won't be with man's words of wisdom or eloquence, but it will be a demonstration, a fresh demonstration of the Spirit's power. God, may our hearts in lives be attuned with you, and may you uh, give us the wisdom and the strength to apply what we hear to our lives, to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen and amen. Well, biblical prophecy is one of the most fascinating phenomena in history. Uh, in its simplest form, prophecy is to make a prediction of or foreshadow of an event that will occur. Now, when we think about predictions, people make predictions all the time. I mean, we see it everywhere. We try to predict the outcome of a game. For instance, a few years ago, I was in Pittsburgh for a district conference, and about 20 of us pastors, after it was over, we went to a Pittsburgh Pirates game. And I have it on video. I literally predict that Adam Frazier will hit a walk-off home run over right field and put it in the water. And as we're waiting, as the pitch is thrown, we all jump in the air and I say, I knew it! He had done it! It was awesome! It was awesome. My prediction came true. People predict the weather. We have the all Farmer's Almanac for that. If you're like me, you like to predict the outcome of movies or TV shows. I've been told, though, that I need to keep my predictions to myself. We make large predictions. Small predictions, easy and hard predictions. We make minor and major predictions. Predictions that would seem not that big of a deal, but we also make predictions that if they come true, it's a huge deal. It's a sacrifice. And with every prediction, I can't help but think that people ask, could it be? Now, when people say, could it be, I think that there's one of two reasons why they respond this way. Either they doubt that it will occur, could it be? Could it be? Or they want it to happen so badly they try to convince themselves of it. Could it be? Could it be? Maybe they even try to predict the predictions. When it will happen, what it will look like, how will it affect this or that. I mean, we see many prophecies 
within the Bible. Each prophet gave their own prophecies. We see prophecies through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We see other prophecies that we don't really talk much about. Amos, Obadiah, Malachi. We see prophecies that were given by Jesus in the New Testament. And when Jesus comes, we see that prophecies are finally fulfilled. When he's presented at the temple by his his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, Luke tells us, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, listen to this, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now now notice how Simeon was, we're told, waiting for the consolation of Israel when prophecy would finally be fulfilled through the coming of the Messiah. And God promises Simeon two things. First, he says it was revealed, it was prophesied to him that he would not see death before seeing the Messiah. And two, What's even cooler is that we see that Simeon was moved by the Spirit. Did you hear that phrase? Moved by the Spirit to enter the temple courts just at the right time. It was divinely appointed. And Simeon praises God. He actually gives his own prophecy. He says this, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. There's no doubt in my mind, Simeon is seeing Jesus, holding him in his arms and saying, could it be? Could it be? Wow. Could it be? be? He was confident that Jesus was the Messiah of the world. Here's something else I want to point out. Simeon's prophecy doesn't exclude any single person. Not one person. He mentions that Jesus will provide salvation even for the Gentiles. He's looking beyond the moment. That's prophecy. Now, any good Jew knew that this Messiah would rule and reign on earth, that he would establish his kingdom and and bring power back to Israel. But looking past Jesus' death and resurrection, even his own disciples in Acts 1-6 say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Even the disciples had a limited approach, while Simeon knew Jesus was going to come and save the world. Could it be? Is this the moment that the prophecy is is fulfilled? You know, I got to ask you, have you ever missed something before? Like you were really looking forward to it, but but your timing was off or it just didn't work out. And in the moment, it, it can be frustrating, right? It can be devastating or disappointing. I mean, remember, the Jews this entire time, they're focused on a specific Messiah. They have prophecy after prophecy of who is to come. And so today we celebrate Palm Sunday. We see Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem. But listen, it didn't take long for the same people to have their praise turned to scorn. Their cheers turned into jeers. But I I want us to look at this triumphal entry in light of a prophecy that was given by Zechariah. Remember I, I said how 
uh, small prophecies are made. Sometimes as I read the Bible, I wonder at times, why, why is that put in there? Is that really necessary? Like, what kind of animal the Messiah is riding on? Does it really matter? And, and, and one of those moments happens here as I prepared with this, this message. So, with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to John 12. John 12, 12 through 15. We'll skip over to Zechariah in a moment, but we'll look at John 12 to begin. John 12, 12 through 15. The first part is out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion, see your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. How do you handle out of the ordinary? The peculiar, the strange, the unusual, the different. Not too long before this, we we see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after being dead for four days. I mean, isn't that unusual? I'd say so. And what's incredible is that Mary and Martha have this similar, this similar yet, yet different reaction to the entire thing. But then we come to the beginning of John 12, and we're told six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where, Je- where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Think about this for a moment. Isn't this strange? I mean, this whole scenario is, is different. It's out of the ordinary. The only normal part about this is what Martha's doing. She's serving. Everything else is just weird. It's different. I mean, you've got the newly resurrected Lazarus reclining at the table, and I I wonder what the conversation was centered around. I mean, did, did did they rehash the whole life, then death, then coming back to life thing? Could it be? Maybe they talked about new opportunities or what Lazarus was going to do now that he has a second chance at life. I mean, this is so out of the ordinary. Not only that, you've got Mary, mind you, women at this point should have been serving their guests and Martha got the memo, but Mary, I mean, you, you want to talk about out of the ordinary. She takes this expensive perfume and anoints Jesus with it. This expensive perfume, according to Jewish Iscariot, uh, she wastes it on Jesus. And not only that, Jesus says it was intended that she, get, she save the perfume for the day of my burial. Okay, another out of the ordinary moment. If this perfume was saved for burials, why didn't she use it on her brother Lazarus? When he died. I mean, and think about this. She was so excited. that She couldn't wait to anoint Jesus with it. Furthermore, according to Jewish tradition, the only people who were anointed were high priests and kings. High priests and kings. Mary anoints Jesus as king. She makes it personal. And and what's captured here in this moment is is what the crowd gathers to do the next day at the triumphal entry. Another out of the ordinary moment. This great crowd filled the road with palm branches and their own cloaks they laid down as if they're creating this, this modern day red carpet 
And, and what's amazing is all throughout Jesus' ministry so far, Jesus is coming and going, and, and in every direction, he's going and, and he's, he's teaching and healing and doing miracles. But here we see that the great crowd pursues Jesus. They take the initiative, and they're all shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. And there's an agreement here with Mary anointing Jesus as king the day before. The crowd proclaims, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus is king. Hallelujah! Which brings us to a prophecy that was fulfilled. Could it be? Could it could it really be? Could Jesus be the Messiah? I mean, everyone is banking on this moment that Jesus would reign and rule over Israel. I mean, in Zechariah, we see, in, in, in Zechariah and in John here, we see, do not be afraid. See, your king is coming. Seated on a donkey's colt? Don't miss the importance of this. Your king is coming. Could it be? How, how do we know? How do we know that our king is coming? You'll know him because he'll be riding on a donkey's colt. What? R really? A, a, a seemingly small and insignificant prophecy actually is one of the most important ones. He, he, he's riding on a donkey's colt. That's him. That's, that's the Messiah. It's Jesus? You know, it's in the moments, if you think about it. It's in the moments of peculiarity that makes us truly wonder. That makes us think. If you think about it, we don't ever really question or doubt or get curious over the normality of things or the ordinary. No, no, it's only when we are faced with the out of the ordinary moments that we begin to ask, could it be? Really? Could it be? Let's look at Zechariah 9, 9 through 13. A prophecy fulfilled. A prophecy fulfilled. Zechariah 9, 9 through 13. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from seas to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. How long did it take to fulfill this prophecy that we see in Zechariah? How long did it take? Over 500 years! 500 years, that's a long time coming. And what's the overall attitude that we see who will be witnesses of the Messiah and the triumphal entry? Zechariah says, rejoice greatly. Rejoice greatly. Another way of expressing that is to say, exceedingly rejoice. Praise Him. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights above. Praise the Lord from the earth, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. 
His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for His people a horn, the praise of all His saints of Israel, the people close to His heart. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! How awesome! How majestic is that? I love when it says He has raised up for His people a horn. You see, this was a symbolism for the future king. It meant strong one. But could it be? Could this prophecy be fulfilled through Jesus? Strong one meant, meant mighty warrior, one who is strong in battle. They were looking, they were all looking for a, a warrior king. But here, this prophecy from Zechariah depicts a different kind of strength. His righteousness and salvation, listen, His righteousness and salvation, the Messiah to come, will, will be not marked by physical, or, or, uh, physical strength or manipulation or coercion. No, it will be marked by gentleness and peace. It says that He will proclaim peace to the nations. Now, we know that kings, they, they rule a certain nation, a specific territory that's theirs and theirs alone. But this prophecy says that His dominion will extend from seas to sea. His kingdom will be eternal. And it will last forever. It will have no end. You know, there's a a reference in Zechariah's prophecy here that, that's always intrigued me. It starts in verse 10a. It says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. Once again, this, this is out of the ordinary. I mean, could it be that power and influence could come without war and military might? I mean, you have to understand that nation after nation during this time, they prided themselves on the strength of, of their military. The only way to dominate nations and overtake lands was through their military prowess. And yet, Zechariah makes a prophecy that the chariots and the war horses and the battle bow will be taken away, they will be broken and discarded. Where persuasion came by force, that's not what we see here in this prophecy. This is of a different persuasion. Peace to the nations? Setting prisoners free from the waterless pit? How? How on earth is this going to happen? Don't miss it. Don't miss it now. Look, look at verse 11. Because of the blood of my covenant. Now, listen, we've been talking about military and power and strength, wars and battles. We have to understand blood has to be shed for battles to be won. There's no question about that. Bloodshed was the sacrifice that brought freedom from captivity, that ended feuds and aligned nations to one another. But, but this blood of my covenant, this isn't refer, referring to battles or wars. No, this is a prophecy of Jesus' blood that was poured out for us on the cross. blood of the covenant that sealed the fate of all those who would put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will be called children of God. Paul writes in Romans 3, 23 through 25, we all know verse 23, right? We know it. (laughs) For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we get to verse 24, it follows and says, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus. Cue verse 25 though. Don't miss this. 
God presented him, that's Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement. That simply means to take away sin. Through what? Faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. So then what? When this comes to pass, if if Jesus comes to bring peace to the nations, if Zechariah's prophecy is fulfilled in this moment at the triumphal entry, what does the second part of this prophecy mean? I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. What does that mean? That sounds odd strange. What is God going to do with Judah and Ephraim and Jerusalem, who's known as Zion here? Well, the connection is found in Zechariah 4, 6, and 7. It says, so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring, don't miss this, then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Wow. Listen, don't miss this. God will make the people his weapons. That's incredible. His ambassadors and vessels that would carry out the work of his name. That is what's to come. Zechariah's prophecy is fulfilled at Jesus' triumphal entry. The great crowd aligns the streets to bring worship and honor and glory to Jesus. They they say, save us! They shout, Hosanna! Blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. Has the time finally arrived? Could it be? Turn back to John 12. John 12, 16 through 19. Go after him. Go after him. Verses 16 through 19. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I want to revisit that question I asked at the beginning. Have you ever been discouraged or disappointed by an opportunity that got away? Oh, oh man. If only I would have realized that it was, it was right there in front of me. Wow. How incredible would that have been if, if I would have only have taken the risk. It goes along with that, that saying, you don't know a good thing till it's gone. Can you imagine the emotions and the feelings that would be be racing through the hearts and minds of Jesus' disciples in that moment? It's like that time when when someone asks a question and you know it, like you're for sure, you, you know it, it's right on the tip of your tongue, you just, it's just not coming to you at the moment, uh, but yes, you, you know it, uh, why can't I think of it, why, why can't I say it, and then you're given the answer, and how does 99.99999% of us respond when we find out the answer, oh yes, yeah, that's it, I knew it. You know, I wonder how many times throughout Jesus' earthly ministry that his disciples asked this question. Could it be? Could it be? All the I am statements that Jesus proclaimed, could it be? The the calming of the sea, could it be? And, And lastly, but certainly not least, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, could it be? It's got to be him. 
Yes, Jesus has to be the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who would come to save us. But, but we're told that it's after the fact that they realize it. That they understood all, all that had taken place. I mean, no wonder at Pentecost we see Peter preaches the most incredible sermon in the history of, of Israel and, and mankind. I mean, a coward turned courageous. He even tells the Jews at one point, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves though. For now, we see Jesus' influence and impact on this great crowd that follows him. We can't help but turn our attention to the crowd. I mean, Jesus is no longer telling anyone to keep quiet about who he is and, and what he's here for, right? John even admits, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. I mean, they couldn't stop talking about it. They couldn't stop talking about Jesus' resurrection power. I mean, can you imagine this? This crowd can't help themselves. They've got to spread the word. Hey, listen, you know Lazarus of Bethany? Yeah, the guy that was dead for four days? Guess what? Jesus raised him from the dead. Yeah, I just had dinner with him yesterday. It's amazing. Jesus brought him back. Boom, just like that. With one phrase, Lazarus, come out. That's all it took. Could it be this Jesus who calls a dead man back to life? Could he be the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for? Some believed. Some doubted. But everyone was curious. Who is this Jesus? Who is it? This, this carpenter turned rabbi, the, the one who spoke in the synagogue, the one who met Samaritan women at wells and defended prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. The one who'd heal without reservation. His teaching was so profound, profound and thought-provoking, it left pretty much every single person speechless. Everyone knew it, too. Even the Jewish leaders. They couldn't deny the truth. Here at the end of this passage, it says, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Bingo! I couldn't have said it better myself. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Hey, listen. They didn't say, look how these people have gone after him. They didn't say crowds or this nation or that nation or a specific people group or a select few. No, they say, look how the whole world has gone after him. Could it be? That this Jesus has gotten the attention of the whole world? The triumphal entry would be the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And yet, at the same time, think about this. It would be the beginning of eternity. But for now, we're left to answer the question, could it be? Could it be? In hindsight, we know what's coming, and, and, and even knowing how this ends, my question to you today is, does it motivate you to go after Jesus, to go after Him? What's in your life that you could say, this is why I go after Jesus, this is why I pursue God in my life? I want His will for my life. My prayer is that our desire is twofold. One, to be known by him, and two, to make him known to the glory of his name and to the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. Go in that grace.